lost on time. Shall we start? Well, I think, I think we can start. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session on uh, energy plans and roadmaps uh, for a sustainable future. Please, please come in. There are still some seats. Come in, come in. <laughs> the, uh, we start at nearly on time because we've got a number of presentations and we want to finish at uh, half past three. Uh, my name is Vincent Berutto. I'm the head of the energy unit at the Executive Agency for Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises. Our agency is managing various programs on behalf of the European Commission, uh, large parts of uh, Horizon 2020, and the COSME program for SMEs, and the LIFE program for environment and clim climate. And my unit in particular is responsible for the uh, energy efficiency projects uh, supported under H2020. And the projects we will hear about in this session are all funded by uh, H2020, which is a program for research and innovation. We're talking about European cities and region, and as you know, uh, they've been experimenting new ways to plan and deliver a sustainable energy transition. By new ways, I mean much deeper involvement of stakeholders, including different layers in the governance, and also looking much forward, much ahead, and having a longer time horizon. And these planning innovations are very much needed and uh, to embed the, the energy transition at local and regional levels and ensure that it delivers social, economic, and environmental impacts. And the role of cities and region, I think we've, we've heard since last, since yesterday actually, since the opening sessions, we heard a lot about the role in cities and regions to reach the EU targets, but also the national and regional targets. And the, the cities and regions have proven uh, instrumental in driving the energy transition, not only by meeting the target, but very often by exceeding the targets that have been set at European level. That's the reason why the Commission has continued uh, supporting the Covenant of Mayors. Uh, for 10 years now, there are more than 7,000 signatories. It's a, it's a very big movement. If you count the population that is covered by the Covenant of Mayors signatories now, it's nearly half of the EU population. Covenant of Mayors has evolved. It is addressing now uh, climate mitigation and climate adaptation. It's also looking more widely outside Europe to access to energy in the form of uh, CCAPs, the Sustainable Energy and Climate Action Plans, with, with a 2030 time horizon. There's, at the same time, there's an increasing recognition at international and European level of the importance of long-term roadmaps uh, that give a clear directions in, in terms of how our sustainable energy and climate future should look like and what intermediary steps and measures should be put in place to meet uh, the targets. And during this session, which I hope will be very interesting to all of you, we'll have the chance to learn from several initiatives taking place at local level. We will talk to people who are really hands-on, I mean, experience from the ground, they will tell us about concrete examples from different parts of Europe. So we'll cover different countries. That will be quite uh, wide in terms of geographical coverage. And uh, we're happy to have among our speakers uh, several representatives from cities and regions, project developers as well, who will be able to give us hands-on testimonials on their own initiatives. They will give us some insight, each of them, on the, uh, into the planning and the road mapping journey that they have uh, implemented in the territories, highlighting the concrete steps uh, that they have taken, the tools that they have designed or used uh, for that purpose, and they will showcase some very concrete examples of the work in several cities and regions. We've asked them specifically to be very pragmatic, very concrete, and tell us what they've learned from their experience on the ground. We've, we'll have six projects presented. They're all supported by H2020. The road mapping journey, I mean, starts, of course, with the engagement of whole, all the stakeholders, and uh, you will learn about uh, diverse participatory uh, processes that they have experimented in the projects, such as, uh, for instance, the Forerunners and Paramount, and that would be the first project, for instance, the co-creation, uh, regional living labs, or participatory knowledge sharing. I mean, there will be different approaches presented, and you will be able to comment on this. And then, of course, when we talk about road mapping, we need to talk about implementation. And you will also hear about projects focusing more on the implementation, implementation side of plans and roadmaps, uh, the barriers, 
ahead of us if we want to implement these roadmaps and the financial solutions that exist. And that will be the last project presenting it. So six projects at a time will be counted for each of them. You will be able to use the Slido uh, tool as well. It's very easy. You use your smartphone. Uh, you go to slido.com. You choose the room, which is Polak. And then you have the opportunity to do, to do two things, either to ask questions, and these questions will be answered by the speakers at the end of the session, or uh, you can also participate in a poll. Uh, so a question uh, has been put forward here, which is on the scale of sufficient, not sufficient, so on a scale between 1 and 10, uh, please evaluate your capacity of participating in long-term energy planning and policy development. We want to hear from you what is the capacity collectively in the room here. It's completely anonymous. Ask your questions also using the other uh, menu of Slido. You can ask questions to the speakers. After the first two speakers, we'll take a first round of questions, and then we'll move on with the other speakers. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is uh, Andreas Karner. Andreas is a senior consultant in Kunz Plus Ultra in Austria. Um, the presentation will be on one project called Panel 2050. It's, it's a project that has the particularity to focus exclusively on Central and Eastern Europe and to combine the road mapping exercise with a capacity building program targeting local stakeholders to increase the policy advocacy and planning skills. In particular, and you will hear it's quite interesting, forerunners identified in each participating region and see how these forerunners can bring forward um, the uh, energy transition. And be, uh, and be instrumental for the change in the territory. So, Andres, uh, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm glad to be here and start the rally of short presentations on uh, energy roadmaps and uh, regional energy uh, planning. Um, thanks for the introduction, Marcel. Thanks for also setting the scene. I mean, our project is one of the projects that um, have tackled the issue of um, energy roadmaps and the role, especially, um, of regions in achieving EU 2050 sustainable energy goals. And the reason why we are doing this is, is also special, and as so has mentioned it, we are focusing in our project especially on Central and Eastern European uh, countries, 10 of them, which I will also then shortly show you, um, which are also special in their basic, well, history. I mean, we all know where they are from. They have shared, well, post-Soviet uh, culture. They have similar geographical um, characteristics. And they have also all related issues to energy planning. And this issue of energy planning was also taken as a, uh, let's say, as an input and as a starting point to think about how can we move forerunners and how can we create forerunners um, in selected regions. And basically, um, I will give you a short well, introduction to our project. Panel 2050, that's the name of the project. As I said, this is going to support, it's ongoing. Um, we are already in our third year of um, implementation. Um, and the aim of panel is to create durable and replicable sustainable energy networks at local levels, well, meaning municipalities, community level, but also at regional levels. And sometimes this, well, differentiation between regions or we may also call them sometimes micro-regions, communities and, and urban uh, areas is something that is also challenging because, uh, as we know, there are different uh, issues and different challenges related to um, these uh, uh, administrative structures. The panel project focuses on the creation of sustainable energy networks in these countries, um, where we think and where we have seen that this um, network approach has been so far absent. I mean, there are some regions, there are some cities which, which are very active and which have also started to develop uh, what we call energy roadmaps and energy strategies. But generally, the idea of this project behind is um, to help communities and regions and um, 
in the, in the Central Eastern Europe, uh, European states to develop roadmaps and roadmaps that will be also necessary for the transformation into a low carbon economy. And what we are doing here is, a, an, let's say, an, the innovative approach of this project is um, to identify, support and build the capacity of so-called forerunners. I will come to that in a minute. Um, and through these forerunners build capacity and capacity in terms of methodological approaches and also in the way how can these communities and these stakeholders on the local and regional levels uh, be supported in the development of uh, roadmaps on, on their scale, basically. And in, in, another, in another way, this project is also going to establish a network, bringing together stakeholders um, at different levels uh, of the sustainable energy sector throughout the regions, and but also trying to interact between the regions. Um, just a few words about our approach. Um, what we have in mind to, uh, to look for, uh, into our, let's say, approach of work in the, in the, in the development of roadmaps is a basically a two-step two um, in supporting developing a methodology for regional regions. We think, and from experience that we have also from, from other countries, from my country where I'm coming from, Austria, we have a very long history, let's say, in, in supporting municipalities in developing um, sustainable energy strategies on a community level, but on the regional level. We are going to help these regions to develop regional visions, something that is a basic idea and developing let's say, basic uh, visions and ideas that will also support these uh, stakeholders built upon uh, a strategy that we call regional roadmaps. So this, these roadmaps are basically um, our center acting point of, 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 let's say, strategic development. Uh, roadmaps that will be developed in 10 different regions in, in across our 10 countries. And that will be also um, enhanced by regional action plans. So basically, this whole strategic support um, is, is taken further throughout our project. And what we do in addition, and this is basically also uh, work uh, facilitated through the project and supported uh, within this H2020 project, uh, is doing parallel capacity building activities. So it's it's a challenge to, first of all, identify who are the forerunners, who are the people that are really engaged in the process, who are the stakeholders, but they all need a certain kind of methodological input. We are also talking about doing local trainings. Um, we are doing a so-called forerunner boot camp. This was already implemented two months ago in, in Hungary. And we are supporting them with what we call energy advocacy training guidebooks. So this is basically the um, support process which will also create a lot of new methodologies and a lot of new inputs, especially for stakeholders in Central Eastern European countries. Um, and what you see here basically on the right, um, I don't know if this, no, it not, doesn't work here, um, the season, uh, logo is this something that we are calling the Central Eastern European Sustainable Energy Network. We are trying to engage uh, and to collect, uh, co uh, establish a collaboration between stakeholders across these countries and across regions. And again, I will also come to that uh, in a second. Season platform. This is basically a virtual platform. Um, and it's supposed to support um, the communication. So it's a kind of interactive platform that has been already set up. Um, and it's a platform to connect stakeholders. It's going to present ideas and find cooperation opportunities between stakeholders of a certain region, but also across the countries. So far we have uh, 420 active members um, but we are all, well, our target is far, far bigger. We want to establish this network as a, let's say, very strong interactive network across uh, Central European countries, but also 
uh, in other countries, inviting other countries. So basically what participants and registrars to this platform will, will benefit from is first of all information and tools and material developed in that project but it will also provide a forum for the exchange of experience. And this is something that we would also like to enhance. And this is also something that has not been, let's say, in the cultural approach of, of, of these countries to exchange experience. Um, so we want to get support for developing supplementing ideas for a low carbon economy in that region. And this forerunner concept, this is something, this is basically um, uh, our key approach. What are forerunners? Forerunners are basically individuals or organizations. Those are necessary in order to lead a stakeholder dialogue or to set up a stakeholder dialogue. So this can be completely, well, this can be representative from different organizations, from public institutions, from communities, mayor, mayor council, but also uh, we tend to involve energy utilities, um, NGOs, business representatives, general public interested. So the idea is that forerunners are the, let's say, the key um, uh, well, individuals or, or organizations that are leading the process and that are also um, identified to provide input and that also guide through the um, roadmap development process. So we see these forerunners also as important multiplicators. And that's, uh, again, something that this season platform wants to um, provide, an establishment of an interactive platform between stakeholders. And through forerunners, we will also establish, let's say, kind of um, continuous stakeholder involvement. Um, this season roadmapping model, this is basically a four-step approach. What are we doing in, in, in developing these this roadmaps is basically, um, first of all, we need to have a kind, kind of baseline. We need to know what the situation, what the baseline energy uh, status of the region is, of, or of the community is. Uh, we have so-called uh, regional energy profiles developed. Uh, we have also developed these methodologies to, uh, for, for these regional stakeholders to elaborate it. We are guiding them to develop a vision. A common vision is the basis for having a good strategy developed. And the strategy is basically what, what is then uh, leading to the roadmap. And the roadmap will then on a case-by-case -case basis, and each region will have different priorities, identify priority areas for reaching their visions. So meaning uh, technologies, uh, pilot developments, um, that will then also lead to um, actions that will also follow into an action plan. Let me just, before we, uh, I get to some conclusion, give you some, some two, two success stories that we, have, that we are working on currently and that have already been, well, they are, they are in the process of being developed of, of two of our partners. One of them is in Czech Republic and the other case is from Hungary. Um, energy transition roadmap in South Bohemia. This is one of the regions participating here. Uh, by the way, this, this pro pro program was also awarded yesterday under the Young Leaders Award, uh, which is basically uh, developing a roadmap for a sustainable building sector in the region uh, through the strengthening of development of what they call self-sufficient houses. So it's basically a methodology that also inspires young architects, engineers, in developing, um, let's say, kind of autonomous um, houses, very innovative houses. And what the region has done, and what the stakeholders in this region have done, um, is to <coughs> basically create a vision that by 2050, uh, the development of self-sufficient and off-grid buildings will become a building that will be affordable and this standard that will be also followed by the region of South Bohemia. So this is basically the vision that this uh, project has developed. What you cannot see here in detail, but anyway on the right hand picture uh, on the bottom is uh, a kind of stakeholder mapping. What we have done, in, and this is part of the process, is to identify who are the stakeholders and 
well, basically gather them around the vision and the stakeholder uh, roadmap development. And there you see that we have um, different scale of stakeholders and different categories. We have basically local production companies, we have suppliers, we have energy distributors, we have research and development institutions, we have different experts and professionals, um, we have the municipal authorities, and uh, in a way we are trying to categorize them, which ones are supportive, which are also driving the change, which are also driving the roadmap, and which ones were, are the ones which might be a little bit in an opposing role, in which we need to uh, to integrate. So this, this approach is, is basically that's the way that Czech uh, partner is following. And how you can see here, I don't go into details because time is short. Um, we are basically following this roadmap approach um, and also action plans, which will also lead um, to specific cases. Um, and the roadmap that is called Sustainable Building Sector in Czech Republic through strengthening development of self-sufficient houses. And for that you need, of course, certain actions and you need to certain uh, activities that you, need, uh, that you need to follow. Another example, very briefly, uh, comes from, from Hungary. Um, there is a region in the northeast of Hungary, you can see the black, let's say the black, uh, uh, part of the map in the in the scale where we uh, which is different from the other regions. This is the only region in Hungary where coal is still the major source of energy, and this 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 region requires specific treatment uh, in terms of energy, socioeconomic, and basically environmental aspects. And what is special is that, well, there is a lot of households still using lignite for heating. Um, more than 150 municipalities use lignite for heating. And this results, of course, in a lot of issues, socioeconomic issues, uh, because those households using lignite are usually the, the very poor ones, live in energy poverty. Miners and workers lost their jobs because part of these coal mines are also closing down. Um, and we have, of course, environmental issues, health issues related to this. So this was the basic starting point for creating a vision which says by 2030, phase out of lignite mining and lignite-based heating in residential and municipal buildings is the key. And this is what the region wants to achieve, um, which through a partnership approach. Again, we have done a stakeholder mapping, uh, and this stakeholder mapping also shows that we need to have a very broad in information and very broad uh, inclusion of different uh, stakeholders. The engagement that focuses especially on these four, let's say, key stakeholders, insulation material producers, boiler producers, district heating companies, and local municipalities, and which will then lead to pilot measures, and these pilot measures is basically following into the roadmap and to the action plan of this specific um, Hungarian region. Just to conclude my presentation, um, we would like to, well, um, also offer the opportunity, and this is what we, what, what we are trying to do here, is also not to present this project, but also uh, ask you to become part of the low carbon community in Central Eastern Europe season. You can maybe see the link downstairs, uh, down on the bottom. Um, we will provide a lot of information there and we are also open for collaborations, of course, with other projects and other initiatives in that region. That's it from my side here, just a very brief overview on what we have been doing and what we are do about to conclude over the next month within panel 2050. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Andreas. That was very clear and you've kept the time. And I, I'd like to know more about these foreigners. I'm very interested in the concept. I'd like to know who they are and what motivates them. But let's see at the end of the presentations if we have time for that. I'd like to come to the next presentation now as the second project. And we will look again at uh, stakeholders' uh, engagement, but uh, from a different perspective. And I'd like to welcome Bernadette Bergsma, who is uh, EU Policy and Project Advisor 
in the city of Eindhoven in the Netherlands, and she works in the EU Brussels office, if I understood right. And she would present another methodology of creating roadmaps to 2050, which was developed in a recently finished project called R4E, which stands for Roadmaps for Energy. And this is a methodology which is strongly focusing on the co-designing process and includes a high level of stakeholder engagement. And they've been tested this uh, process in eight cities. So, Bernadette, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will stay, straight away start with the, with the presentation, which is, as has already been set on Roadmaps for Energy, in which we developed a new type of energy strategy based on visions and roadmaps in eight different European cities in co-creation with uh, local relevant stakeholders. So why co-creating? Well, one, as you know the story of uh, Alice in Wonderland, if you don't know where you're heading to, you don't know how to get there. So you need to know your ending point in order to know the steps to take. And that's why we applied the backcasting method within R4E, which means that uh, we involve relevant stakeholders, meaning uh, public, private entities, businesses, startups, uh, citizens, knowledge institutes, and so on, everybody relevant in the field of uh, sustainable energy uh, would be involved in this process, looking into how can we cr create a common vision for the future of our city on sustainable energy. And then you go back to the present, look at the baseline, and see which steps to take in order to get to that vision. So the road to commitment here is, of course, of crucial importance. And um, very important here is to make all the relevant stakeholders and all the project partners understand what this roadmap actually is. What does it mean? What is the, the, the role of each and everybody in this whole process? And why is this important for us and for all the parties involved? In order for them to become aware, understand, and believe in the process. And that way, they will also become project owners, so owners of the roadmap and of each and every single step to take within that roadmap to become this future city that we have envisioned. So why roadmapping? What is it? So within uh, R4E, roadmapping consists of four different steps, ambition setting, vision development, roadmapping, and developing a project portfolio. And within each step, we actually follow the same structure. Uh, meaning that at first we would have uh, local individual city workshops, meaning that in each and every single of the eight partner cities we had workshops with relevant stakeholders of that city. Uh, to, become, to get to that stage of ambition setting in the first step, and then at the end we would come together, all the R4E partners would come together in a joint meeting and share their results, share their experiences and learn from each other and if possible, even uh, adapt their plans. Um, ambition setting, what does it actually mean? Ambition setting is really to say, what is the dream I have for the future of my city? In this case, on the field of sustainable energy. So what we did is interview and uh, have workshops with policymakers, decision makers, and all the relevant stakeholders involved to ask them, what is your future city? What does your future city look like? and how can we uh, b create a common ambition for the city. So at the end, all the visions were uh, um, brought together and we had three priorities, uh, prioritized strategic ambitions set for each of the cities. Uh, this is an example of the ambitions of one of our partner cities, Istanbul, for traffic management towards 2050. As you can see, we had three specific ambitions and these were further detailed uh, and with more prioritized ambitions as well. Um, all the details, I'm not gonna go through the details, this is just to show you the way it looks like because we, we work a lot with visuals in Roadmaps for Energy, which really helps us to, to, to facilitate discussions and co-create. So step two is vision development and a vision is the long-term perspective on the energy in the city. Um, here we apply the future telling research method and the future telling research method uh, is really um, 
a creative way to uh, gain um, experiences and ideas from thought leaders and experts in the field of smart cities and sustainable energy. And from there on, we also analyzed all the results coming from these interviews and methods, which uh, actually at the end, we had 18 drivers for change, which really influenced the cities of the future. And these 18 drivers for change were then shared with the project partners and they used it in their local workshops with their relevant stakeholders. So um, they chose the relevant uh, drivers for change that were applying to their city, and they also used the ambition setting uh, results from step one. So together with this, they were able to create really specific visions and common vision for their own city for 2050. This was, this was of course done step by step in a few days, and at the end, uh, we, uh, every, every uh, partner city had a desired future scenario, which would look like this. This is the desired future scenario of Eindhoven in 2050 in the field of smart urban spaces, uh, focusing, of course, on sustainable energy. And each of the partners within R4E had such a poster. And this really enabled us to see what do we have in common? What do you have different? What can we learn from each other? Step three is the road mapping. Road mapping is really making a map with possible routes to create, to become that visionary city. Um, again, interviews were uh, uh, done with experts and thought leaders in the field of sustainable energy. And a desk study took place, which really took place um, for over a year time. And this desk study and the interviews were analyzed and a general roadmap was created. The general roadmap is what you see at the, at the bottom, well, this little, <laughs> with the red um, thing around. Uh, so this is really, at the end, you have the vision, you have the roadmap, and there are specific steps that you can take in order to get to that vision. Uh, the general roadmap was then shared with the project partners, and they used it again in their local workshops with their re relevant stakeholders to see, okay, this is, the re this is the general roadmap. Our vision is put at the end. How can we actually uh, come to this vision that we have with the opportunities and the, the future technologies that are foreseen? And so they had to set milestones for 2030 and 2020, and also some research projects were implemented already, were set in the, in, the, in the roadmap. And this resulted in a specific roadmap for the future scenario of that city. Uh, at the end, the final step was a project portfolio, and this actually already started in step three, which is uh, well fulfilling filling the roadmap with specific uh, programs and projects in order to come to that vision. And uh, in step four, we did this more in, in only with the project partners of R4E to see, okay, where are we standing now? What is each of our city's vision? And how can we actually uh, um, work together and work on common projects. So consortia have been built. We are looking into, even though the project has finalized, we're still looking into options to fulfill the vision of 2050 for each of our cities. And if we can work together, that's, that's really what we're aiming for. So what have we learned within R4E? We have actually learned that political engagement is crucial. Without this political engagement, it's even harder to really engage the relevant stakeholders and to get this engage engagement within the municipality itself as well. Also, imagine there is a political change. Uh, you have the support from the local ecosystem and from the rest of the municipality in order to continue the plans that you set within the road mapping process. So this is crucial. And another w thing that we really um, had to, well, we had to learn is that the way of working is really not something that everybody's used to. So we are working in different cultures, we have different cultures, and not all the cultures have the, well, they're not used to working with all stakeholders and involving people from outside our organization. So from the start, you really have to engage each and every single stakeholder that you, you find important in this process, explain what this really means, and get their acceptance and belief in the process. And of course, visuals, which really helped us a lot in order to, to create a co-creative process, a participatory process, and to share and facilitate the discussions. 
the impact of R4E is really the creation of these ecosystems at local level within the partnership of R4E and of course as well with the thought leaders and experts that we interviewed in order to get their views and ideas for the future. And um, the foundation for extended cooperation is really something very valuable for us because that way we can further work on the results that uh, came from R4E. And we have seen that cooperation and cross-learning really spurs development. So I would really say to everyone, you know, we have to roadmap because this is really the way forward. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, please have a look at the Open Innovation Yearbook 2017-2018 because there you can find an article really about roadmaps for energy and the co-creative process, which was written by me and my colleagues from the Eindhoven University of Technology. So if you want more information, please have a look. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Bernadette. I mean, ambition setting, vision development, road mapping, portfolio of projects, I got it. It's quite simple. It's quite clearly, clearly presented. Uh, as I promised, I think we have time for a couple of questions quickly. If any one of you wants to take the floor. Uh, on the screen here, you see the, the questions that were asked in the, using the Slido tool. They're quite general, so we could keep them for the end. But if there are questions on these two specific projects, then uh, I'd rather take them now. If they're not, since we don't have so much time, I would move to the third project, which is uh, Intense PA, which stands for Integrated Regional Energy Planning through Public-Private People Partnerships. And um, we saw in the last two presentations that the role of stakeholders in the planning process is key. And now in this project, we will showcase uh, a, a new approach to facilitate the involvement of stakeholders. <laughs> Uh, that's called the Living Labs. And if you don't know what the Living Labs are, uh, the speakers are going to explain to you what it is. And they applied it in seven European regions uh, and municipalities across Europe. And two of the regional partners are here who uh, will uh, share their experience uh, with us. Actually, we'll have three speakers, if I understood right. Uh, we have Joanna Giannulli, who is Senior Consultant, Business and Project Management in Greece, and Mr. Angel Maria Marinero, who's the Regional Director for Housing and Urban Planning Policies at the Junta de Castilla y Leon in Spain, and uh, Mr. Basileos Belis, who's the General Director of the Development Agency of Cardiza in, in Greece. So you've, we've got Spain and Greece, and we've got also representative of uh, the authorities. So that's good. So they can talk from different, with their different point of view. So, Joanna, the floor is yours, and uh, that's for 15 minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for your interest in attending our session. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to present you briefly uh, our approach to integrated sustainable energy planning. Um, as you will find out soon, there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of common ground between uh, the two projects that have been already presented and uh, the project uh, Enlarge and PubbleNet that uh, you will hear for them following my, my presentation. So uh, with Intense PA, uh, we initiated uh, our, our effort, our work, by recognizing uh, the importance of integrated uh, energy theme into spatial planning, and even more to integrate the energy theme with the uh, regional value, the production and consumption chains, so that uh, we, uh, we will be able to uh, organize and plan projects that are less vulnerable to failure and societal resistance. Uh, express it differently to organize, to, to develop projects that will be, uh, from the technical and uh, legal uh, point of view, uh, feasible, that they will be acceptable by the community and uh, having these two requ requirements met, uh, bankable actually what is needed to have a real uh, and easy uh, energy transition. To implement such planning, uh, actually you need a, a, an approach that uh, will be multi-level and uh, multi-actor and uh, uh, supported by an interdisciplinary uh, working team. So within Intense PA, we develop such an approach and moreover, we developed a, an environment to implement this approach, an environment that uh, can uh, provide uh, support the interdisciplinary team working, 
that uh, will ensure the uh, development of sustainable relationships, which is very important, through engagement and trust creation, that uh, will be uh, also supportive to uh, experiential learning and transfer of knowledge, and of course, will support innovative thinking, which is uh, most important. So Living Labs, Living Lab concept is uh, uh, a perfect match uh, with uh, our, um, our needs, our requirements. Since it is both an environment and an approach uh, for conceiving, prototyping, evaluating and refining complex solutions in uh, multiple and evolving real-time environments like the one that, uh, like energy planning uh, environment. We wanted our project to be a um, representative of uh, EU, of the European Union, and uh, ensure that we are going to have transferable and uh, um, uh, replicate, uh, results that can be replicated. So we organize a network of seven, uh, of seven regional living labs in a different level of uh, governance and uh, in seven different member states. Uh, accomplishments so far are very encouraging. Uh, in these two years that our project is running, we have uh, uh, more than 300 uh, um, stakeholders, mainly public authorities and societal actors, have been involved in the works of these uh, uh, seven uh, living labs uh, by participating in the decision-making process and uh, the co-planning uh, approach. More than 120 uh, such meetings have taken place and uh, several events uh, for training, uh, public authorities and uh, awareness of uh, the general public and uh, related uh, stakeholders. They have delivered seven integrated sustainable energy plans focused on the different issues that uh, involve, that consider uh, investments of about uh, 700 million uh, euros on renewables and energy efficiency projects and that impact uh, almost a million of uh, European uh, citizens. Uh, also, uh, evaluation results are also uh, very uh, rewarding. Uh, we have uh, the, the evaluation uh, so far revealed that uh, in three out of the seven regional living labs, uh, we have not completed the evaluation uh, to the rest of them, uh, the perception of the stakeholders involved in relation to the overall performance of both the approach implemented and the plans developed is uh, very high. Um, it's worth, mention uh, uh, worth mentioning uh, and reflect on some uh, uh, issues, some uh, statements that public authorities mainly uh, provide during the evaluation process. Uh, like the fact that uh, through the Living Lab process and uh, this uh, new way of planning, uh, the different authorities and departments realize the power of their mutual cooperation. Uh, the fact that this multi-level and in interdisciplinary working uh, resolve, uh, support them to identify the uh, common problems and uh, bottlenecks, and although within these um, two years of working they haven't managed to resolve them, they have managed to, um, to commonly agree on their existence, and this is a very important uh, step of uh, the solving uh, process. Also, living labs uh, provide uh, them the uh, uh, opportunity to reflect on themselves and also they, uh, they make them realize the power of their mutual collaboration. A lot of work was required these two years and uh, intense pay consortium uh, provide a, a real effort and commitment uh, in this, uh, in this um, attempt. Uh, we will not manage it unless we have at least seven local heroes, our uh, Living Labs uh, coordinators. And I will leave the floor to two of them, uh, Mr. Uh, Angel Maria uh, Marinero, who is the uh, General Director of uh, Housing, Architecture and Urbanism of uh, Castilla y León, and Mr. Vasilios Bellis, uh, who is the General Manager of the Development Agency of uh, Cardiza in uh, uh, the region of Thessaly. Uh, good afternoon. Well, I'm going to explain just three minutes uh, what the regional government of Castilla y Leon has achieved within this project. Uh, what we have in mind uh, was to fight the weak, the very weak link between energy issues and urban planning, regional planning, housing policies in our current 
planning practice, which is typical of Southern, Southern Europe. Uh, does we proceed uh, first analyzing previous strategies in the right side of the slide, and previous strategies from both the urban planning and energy perspectives, assembling a very large number of stakeholders within a regional level lag framework, and with help from the parallel project uh, Pool and F, which is going to be explained uh, here later. Uh, then we focused on the, on the problems of the development of urban, urban district heating networks filled by, with biomass, uh, because in, you must know that in Spain, uh, urban district heating is something unheard of. We have a lot of uh, field for, for, for improvement there. Uh, we, we all have uh, individual boilers at home and in every building, mostly filled by, by gas. Uh, so public and private initiatives trying to develop Distant heating networks face a lot of problems, normative, administrative, technical, financial, uh, even a lack of understanding by the public. Uh, so, so it is surprising, but it is so. That, that's our regional level lab device, a document of guidelines for sustainable planning of biomass distant heating in the region, mostly oriented to the more than 2,000 local authorities we have within the region, and to help them uh, to develop their um, their, their networks of distant heating networks and hand out its actor responsibilities. E.g., just uh, for, for example, with us, we are the regional government, so we must change the legislation, planning legislation to make clear that distant heating is a public service. It's not clear now. Uh, adopt the whole document as a regional strategy and so by all the actors in the, in the regional level lab. With the final goal to uh, increase the still very low rhythm of development of uh, urban district heating in the region and to, to push it uh, uh, further. Uh, so are we, we are going to fill the gap in the national level. We have a gap between the, in the, in the left, the national policies promoting renewable energy and in the uh, lower uh, side, the city and neighborhood level initiatives that are trying to actually introduce centralist use of biomass for heating. Last words, yes, yesterday we have the final event of the project in the city of Segovia in Castilla y León. There the regional minister, who is my boss, announced the beginning of the process of adoption of these guidelines for as a new regional strategy, which is binding for every uh, other uh, regional policy. Uh, I think it's a, success for, it's a success for the project and I hope you think it's so. Thank you very much. I'm Vasilios Bellis, for the General Director of uh, Development Agency of Karditsa. Uh, we were uh, a partner of this uh, project and uh, we were, were the coordinator of the uh, uh, local uh, regional living lamb. Uh, what is a local uh, living lamb? It is a, a network of uh, local partners, of very significant uh, key organizations uh, playing role in the uh, energy system of our area. For example, in our uh, local uh, living lab, uh, there was the participation of uh, the regional authority, of the municipalities, of the cooperative bank, of uh, the development agency, of course, uh, the chamber of commerce, uh, other chambers like te technical chamber and so on. So all the uh, key organizations were around the table and uh, focused on the uh, solving of the problems uh, and uh, um, uh, to, to resolve the obstacles uh, in front of the development of uh, uh, renewable energy uh, sources of our area. Uh, the uh, st stakeholders were inspired each other and they shared ideas and plans and they uh, created a common uh, vision and a, a common uh, future for the, for the uh, renewable energy sources. So what, what was the, the vision uh, produced and uh, 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 agreed between all together? It was to revitalize the mountain zone where the forests are and to uh, 
to establish a value chain and uh, a supply chain between the forest and the uh, final consumer of biomass. Our prefecture is, is situated in the center of Greece, so there is a lot of biomass, uh, not only in mountains, but in the plains, uh, in the plain area too, uh, as a residue of, of agricultural activities. So this biomass of uh, 200,000 tons per year uh, is a, a, a wealth to be uh, exploited, to be developed. Uh, so with respect to physical environment, we, uh, the task and the vision was to develop some projects, 10 projects were agreed between the uh, local uh, stakeholders uh, towards the uh, production of local health and the local planning of renewable energy sources uh, use. Uh, what, what, are, what is the, the added value? First, the, uh, the, there is a, a concrete strategic plan for the future of the uh, renewable energy sources uh, of uh, our, our uh, uh, prefecture. Uh, there is a constant and interactive way uh, between, uh, to cooperate between all the local actors. And uh, the, uh, this, this, this agreement uh, is, uh, is not established in the frame of this, of this project. This agreement uh, is uh, uh, a base for a future cooperation, and uh, there is a, an M MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, signed by all the local st uh, stakeholders to continue this cooperation uh, in the future. And the role of our agency, the local development agency, will play the uh, will, will act as a uh, uh, support center for the energy transition uh, uh, period for the uh, towards the future of the re renewable energy sources exploitation. And uh, this, this is the, the most valuable result of this project. The promise and the vision and the agreement of the local authorities that they will continue their work uh, until the biomass will be not only a local resource promising uh, uh, to produce wealth, but it will produce wealth uh, uh, for sure. For example, from the last year, a factory is uh, working, established by the energy cooperative, and it produces pellets by the wood uh, and the residues of the local sawmills. And it is a reality, it is a fact, it is an example, it is a result which uh, inspires local population that we can, we are able, not only to plan, but to produce concrete results affecting our, our daily lives. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Joanna, you said earlier that these living labs were uh, highly appreciated by the stakeholders. And when I listened to the other two speakers, I, I trust you. Yes, there's a lot of conviction, a lot of uh, confidence and uh, satisfaction in all what was said here. It's nice to have the local representatives who were in the living lab testifying in front of us and telling us what they think of it. Uh, I'm moving to the next presentation, and then we'll ask for questions if you want. Uh, the next one. Um, the is, uh, will be done by uh, Cristina Vasilescu, uh, who is project manager at the Instituto per la Ricerca Sociale uh, in Italy. And uh, she will present a digital tool. I mean, the other, two the other presentation, the other three presentations actually, were, were discussing about participatory processes applied to uh, sustainable energy planning. Uh, the next speaker will present a digital tool uh, designed by a project called Enlarge. Uh, to help public authorities make their decisions on how to best design their participatory processes 
for local sustainable energy planning. So, Christina, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you. Hello, thank you for uh, inviting us. Uh, we are a little bit different from the presentations you heard before, but yet the focus is uh, the same. So the enlarged project focuses on um, co-creation and co-production, but especially on which are the design features of both processes uh, that uh, may enhance their um, let me put, let me go here. So that may enhance their social legitimacy. That is what we called the capacity of collaborative processes to be accepted as a policy tool by the society. And especially by those that generally prefer to look from the window and not step into the process. And also, which are the design features, which are the mechanisms that enhance institutional sustainability. So that is, how can we make that co-creation, co-productions, either we are speaking about living labs, road mapping, become mainstreamed in the daily practice of public institutions, which are the design features that can enhance this. Uh, and policy effectiveness of collaborative processes. That would be how can we make that processes can really impact on the policies they have been taken for. So not just to be a formal engagement and to say, okay, we have listened to the public or we have involved them, but then we, des we design a totally different policy. So this is the focus of uh, the Enlarge project, which is a two years uh, project uh, financed by the Horizon program and implemented uh, by uh, the University of Turin, uh, the Agency of Local Democracy Agencies in Europe, uh, the Stockholm Environment Institute and the uh, Institute for Social Research, which is the lead partner. What I'm going to focus on today is uh, only one of our, uh, let's say, key deliverables. That is uh, Choose Your Own Adventure book. It is a digital um, book which we are working on now in uh, sustainable energy. So this is basically a game book where you can see the different paths that uh, collaborative processes, either we are speaking about co-production or co-creation, can take the different obstacles that may emerge during the processes and the different corrective solutions that the promoters of the processes could adopt in order to keep it on track. So um, why designing such a book. Uh, why designing a game book? Why not just guidelines and uh, just say, okay, here are the recommendations for the best, best collaborative uh, processes? Well, we actually th think there are no best practices when it comes to the design of public policies. Uh, and we also think that uh, the capacity of collaborative processes to really be part of the democratic system, it depends on those three dimensions I mentioned, I mentioned before. Another uh, assumption that leads us is the fact that uh, the design of the processes might impact different on those three dimensions. For instance, Bernadette was saying before, we have learned that we have to involve the public, stakeholders, uh, citizens from the very beginning. Well, that's, uh, that's one of the turning points, let's say, of uh, collaborative uh, processes. So it might increase social legitimacy, we'll say, but on the other hand, in, uh, it might decrease institutional sustainability because involving stakeholders, citizens, in the entire, the entire process, and especially since the beginnings without having already formulated anything, it might reduce, it might uh, raise criticism in public administration. So politicians might fear they lose power. And so you see there are different ways of impacting on, uh, on the different, uh, on the three dimensions. 
So how we created the book? Well, we analyzed 31 uh, case studies, uh, semi-structured interviews with energy experts, uh, participatory processes experts, and we had a deliberative event uh, involving uh, the representatives of the 31 case studies in Milan with uh, around 80 people. So how does it work, this uh, Choose Your Own Adventure book? Well, what you will going to find when uh, the book will be available for free for everyone at the end of June, it will be published uh, on the website of uh, the project and you can all test it and uh, send us your feedback. Basically, what you can find is a story so we are in a city, which is a small city. We have a mayor and an environment officer that decide to undertake a collaborative process uh, to implement uh, the design of a wind farm and energy efficiency in uh, residential buildings. So you can find the possible dynamics that might happen and unpredictable events. Well, just to say one, uh, one event, well, it might happen that at one point you created a steering committee and one of your stakeholders decides to get up from the committee, criticizing uh, the process you haste in. So then we are going to show which is the impact of this event, basically on the three dimensions I mentioned before. So in this case, it might happen that your social legitimacy might risk to decrease because you have one of the most recognized environmental association in the city criticizing openly a process in which they were involved. And then the question is, how can you deal with it? What can you do? We basically offer some, let's say, corrective solutions or alternatives that you may uh, take. And that is, for instance, you can uh, invite them uh, to explain uh, their reasons, or you can uh, just keep uh, mentioning, uh, keep them into the process by exposing during the process the arguments they, ra they raised or the arguments they raised even from outside the process. You may also involve in the process uh, experts that have the same point of view. This is just to let you know a short example of what you can find and how the story works. I don't know if you can read, but basically what we, can, uh, what we have done is to identify a series of turning points that uh, are the, um, the events that might shape social legitimacy, institutional sustainability, and policy effectiveness in a, in a way or in another, let's say like this. So we have, for instance, uh, wide leeway, meaning that you decide to involve people from the very beginning, or narrow leeway, you decide to involve uh, citizens, stakeholders in a later phase of the process. Of course, these two dimensions may have different impacts on social legitimacy, institutional sustainability, and policy effectiveness. And in the book you are going to find which are these effects both positive and negative and how you can deal uh, with it. We have also other turning points are for instance political steering in-house management versus uh, external control. Okay, I will not just go through them because I have two minutes left. So you, when you go through the book, you can see all them. So this is basically the co-design process for the wind farm. And then we have the co-production process for residential building. And we have the same scheme. So this is basically all on my side. If you want to get involved, what we want you to do is to try the book and get back to us with your feedback. We have uh, committed to update the book for the next two years after the project ends. So there will be plenty of time to send us your feedback and to, also your examples from your direct experience saying, okay, you missed a turning point. We also have this or, okay, I, I've seen there is everything, it's great and uh, it works. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Christina. I'm looking forward to the end of June and seeing the uh, the book. That, that would be interesting. It's good also to see the perspective from uh, other organisation, uh, one which are not so much involved in our energy standard energy projects. 
you are from another strand of Horizon 2020, and in that sense, it's also interesting to hear from, from you about this uh, engagement of uh, stakeholders and uh, policy making. I'm looking at my watch, and we have 20 minutes left, so we've got two presentations. So what I suggest is we go on with the two presentations, and then we will take a little extra time at the end to address some of the questions that are asked on Slido. I'm turning now to uh, Vlasis, Vlasis uh, Wakonomu, uh, who is from a senior researcher uh, from GIN, Climate and Sustainability in the Netherlands. Um, after we heard about uh, different methodologies for energy road mapping and tools, uh, we heard from uh, Christina about the, uh, that we can use for energy uh, planning. We'll hear now from a project called Publnef, where they've developed uh, not only a, a tool, uh, toolbox, uh, which aim is to enable policymakers on regional and local levels to identify solutions uh, to their needs on energy efficiency policy. Uh, but they've also done a very detailed analysis of the needs, the best practices, and obstacles and opportunities in national, regional, and local energy planning. So we'll hear from you, Blasis, in, uh, in about 10 minutes. Yeah. Great. So thank you very much for the time. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, indeed I'll present the project Pablenev. It's on the second year running. Um, from my stage, uh, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll not go through the project details. You can have a look on the website, toolboxes. Just quickly, what we have found. Okay, let's focus on what we have found so far. So, um, what we aim to do is to assess and learn from existing energy efficiency policy implementation practices. So, learning, the first component is learning. The second thing is networking, opportunities within the different layers of the public governance. And the third one is tools, <coughs> tools for more effective energy efficiency policy making. So, um, yeah, in essence, now what we have seen is um, that uh, we have carried out a uh, detailed analysis on, um, on the national and on the regional level for uh, understanding the needs, barriers, opportunities, and see, in essence, what and why policymakers cannot implement. So we don't start from a SEAP, which is the first part of the planning, the Sustainable Action Plan, but rather we move on to what can we do to implement the SEAP. That's our starting point of the entire project. So from a national level, um, yeah, some strengths we've seen is that uh, uh, the difference is that we have the strategic goals normally are always set very clearly with targets. So on the national level, there is a guarantee and po national policymakers know what the targets are. The same, there are also energy modeling exercises, so the no scenarios, which is an important also point. And also, there is, um, from the public sector, the, there are operational goals with specific delivery actions. These are three key components that, if we see on the regional level now, we don't have. So, um, what is the first one? Weakness of the regional and local energy planning, that we don't have modeling, meaning that when we want to set a plan, it's very rare that we do have quantitative analysis of what the scenarios will be with alternatives, optimization tools, and everything. There are very few cases if we compare it, of course, to the national modeling part. Of course, there are also some strengths in the planning on, um, on, uh, on, uh, yeah, on, let's say, on the regional and local energy policy making. The first one is that uh, you can see a lot of different data. I'll just focus on the more important ones. That um, on the regional and local energy planning, sometimes it's easier to mobilize the in-house services rather than the national, which is much more complex. The second one is that um, there is a, often in-house expertise uh, consultants, local consultants, regional consultants, so they can undertake a big part of the work of implementing the action. Um, also, it's easier the communication level. So this is one of the strengths that we balance it uh, next to the weaknesses. So at the more moderate effect, let's say the more moderate level, um, there is a lack, or let's say there is less in-house financial expertise, so they know about the basic schemes. Normally, the subsidy schemes exist from the national to the local level, but very rarely, as we see, that's why we have so many projects running also here on the financing level. Um, also, a lot of uh, understanding, misunderstandings, what is an EPC, energy performance contract, what's a PPP, so we have all these issues on the regional and local level. Then there is also lack, on the technology, lack of knowledge on the technological aspects. Um, like what technologies can be installed to implement the SEAP or the specific policy. Um, and then, of course, at the lower level, one of the main problems what we saw in the regional implementation and the regional planning is the lack of capacity to mobilize the stakeholders needed. There are a lot of conflicting interests, 
So sometimes, although they, they can't bring people to the table, it's quite hard to get decisions out of it. We have, of course, shining examples. And <clears throat> also sometimes it's quite hard to uh, enter, let's say, this competition between the different layers of stakeholders and try to resolve it from a municipality level. Another weakness, of course, which is a standard one, is the budget. Okay, but the budget is something that it's a standard weakness for all types of governance. Um, and uh, another aspect is the lack of available time from local stakeholders to deal with the local problems. Um, and also a lack of mobilization uh, to, uh, to these stakeholders, as we said before. Again, uh, some opportunities and threats is a standard SWOT analysis, of course, as you can see. Um, there is, uh, and there's an opportunity that there is sufficient information on the regional and local level on the, uh, on the legislation and uh, the laws that determine the energy efficiency policy. On the local level, I said, eh? sometimes they're not aware of how the national targets are transposed to the local targets, okay? But on the local level, there is quite sufficient knowledge on that. Um, there is a lot of demand for training possibilities. And that's why we see that most of the trainings taking place and the capacity building work is more done on the, at least on the energy efficiency policy, is more effectively done on the local and regional level rather than the national sometimes. Um, then uh, there is also very rarely conflicting legislation, which is a plus for the planning, so between the regional and uh, national level. And um, as we said, um, there is an important also tool is that uh, there is a taxation, which is a big plus for the planning, meaning that the, normally the regional and the local levels have somehow more authority and more autonomy towards small level taxation changes, which can benefit the energy efficiency policy part. Um, and yeah, more or less that's the whole story that, uh, that you see. Now, um, from our side, what we've done also is that uh, we try to develop and try to make a large inventory of various tools and uh, best practices based and categorized on the articles of the Energy Efficiency Directive. As we said, it's an energy efficiency policy project. Eh? So what we try to do is that we try to split all the best practices based on the various articles of the ED. And by best practices, it was a, a, we tried to accumulate from all various partners. As you see, there's quite a broad range of partners. What we saw, some basic things, is that, especially on the regional level, um, as I put a warning, is that uh, on, in, on all governance levels, there are very few or almost no best practices on the target setting, qualification for the savings, and energy services and monitoring. So that's a big issue that we've seen. We have a lot of different things for information, um, information exchange uh, for the various articles, but when it comes to the Article 1 and the, all the target setting and the qualification, there is indeed a shortage and a lack, which is something that we should be thinking more. Second of all is that um, there we try to analyze and we have a large category. You can see the toolbox, um, you have the links, uh, which is actually is a way that you can post your question as a policymaker, regional or local, and you can find the answer of what options you have in a very simplified way. There we have all, a lot of, let's say, a big category of tools, I think over 150, something like that tools, um, which refer to various aspects like softwares, guidelines, uh, and we've categorized them, again, based on the articles of the directive, so how this can help you in the energy planning also process. So you see that the softwares mainly, when you have this type of software and online tools, they refer to the Article 17, information and training, Article 24, review monitoring, and very limited to audit, et cetera. And other for the guidelines, mainly for financial and technical support, and limited for innovation, et cetera. Now, the problem is that there are almost no tools on the role of public buildings. We don't have really tools or softwares that we have identified. This means that maybe there are very few in this case. Metering, billing, cost of access to metering and billing, penalties, also an important point that we have to take inherent in the energy planning, energy transformation, distribution, qualification, and accreditation and certification scheme. So that's a big lack of the whole story. That's also maybe something for uh, people from the projects that we have to think more. And what we did is now take, we know these problems and we moved into action. So we set up roadmaps. Um, and as I said, roadmaps is an implementation level to overcome the specific barriers. We have seen a lot of different dif uh, you know, uh, identifications of roadmaps today. So that's our identification. We move on from the planning to the implementation. So it means that planning is taken into account. And what we dealt, these are the specific, you can see these are roadmaps in various parts of Europe. Um, there is a clustering, public buildings, public lighting, depending on the, on the types. And the main needs you can see on the left, 
It's, and while we try to address them, there was a lack of knowledge on the technical and communication staff. We have seminars and a lot of workshops, over 50 events on a national regional level, a lot of an EU level. Next is a lack of knowledge on citizens or a practical use of alternative fuels. Again, communication campaigns for engaging citizens. Uh, transposition from national to the regional plans, uh, the problem with the SEAP, so we have to identify the most important policies of a SEAP, not having all the 20, 30 policies that we have. And then and there's the monitoring part. So I think I'm just on time. <laughs> you have a lot of events that you can attend. There is still eight months to go for the project, so feel free. And yeah, you can always collaborate with us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Vlasis. So there's a lot of information in that project. Please have a look at their website. I mean, it's also interesting for us to define where the gaps are and to identify what the funding priorities should be in our programs, EU programs. And moving now to the last uh, presentation, uh, which is um, given by Mia Drakovic, who is scientific researcher at the Institute for European Energy and Climate Policy, as well in, in the Netherlands. And uh, of course, I mean, I think, Blasius, you talked a little bit about financing. I mean, we are going to explore that in more details now, and especially looking at what the, uh, how we can develop peer-to-peer -peer learning of local actors on financing and other issues. Please, Mia. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good, good. Wonderful. Um, thank you all. I'm really actually glad to be last because uh, listening to all the presentations today, it's really nice how it all comes together. So our project is Prospect and it's about a learning program that we created. And I will tell you a bit about this. Uh, but more importantly than what we did, I would like to tell you what you would like to do. And this is that uh, we heard a lot about uh, tools today. We don't create new tools. What we figured is that uh, a lot of tools are already existing. Financing is ex existing. So we already have the solutions. In the morning, if you were here, we heard um, how cities, 75% uh, 70, uh, of people live in cities. 70% uh, of all emissions come from the cities. So we cater to the cities to see what their actual problems are. We bring them in, and uh, we face with, uh, we try to solve their specific solutions in our program. So that's what we do and what you will hear, but also what you can do is share this information because uh, this program is just starting, which means we need all of you, uh, we need uh, to be exact, 160 cities to join and to uh, solve their problems to actually see that things are starting, uh, changes is starting to happen. So when we started uh, planning this program, there were two premises. Um, first was this peer-to-peer -peer concept, again, um, we have a lot of guidelines, we have a lot of materials, but some cities are still not using it. So we thought maybe we as experts are not the best to cater this knowledge to the cities. Maybe we should go to them. Maybe, so we don't all, all, uh, only invite men mentees that we need to teach to do something, we invite mentors also. This means today we heard from Mr. Andreas Karner about uh, this great forerunners. Maybe those forerunners could uh, be invited to our program as, to be mentors. So I really urge you to share this information. Also, when we are done with a part of our program, we can share who our mentors were, and they can, uh, if they're in your region, they can become forerunners. So we should really uh, communicate like this to make this happen. This is the first concept. The second uh, comes back to what Bernadette was saying in the R4E, and that is that uh, it's not about it, it, coming somewhere, you need to know where you need to, you need to go. Unfortunately, what we realize is that many cities really have, don't, have no clue where to start, and it's really hard for them to see, you know, where we want to go, where we can go with the best, but we don't have the money, we don't have the time. There's so much information available and we are lost. So this is what we are trying to solve. Uh, these are our partners, and I'm showing you this because this is a part of our methodology. Uh, we have a group circled here in green uh, that we are very proud of. It's the large networks, FEDER and Energy Cities and EuroCities, and they help us cater to their networks, but we don't only um, work with their members, but uh, any cities or regions, municipalities uh, can join. And also, more importantly, uh, the most important maybe part of our methodology was bringing in as partners cities. We have uh, uh, Trnava in Slovakia, and uh, we have a Portu Portuguese agency uh, on behalf of uh, Portuguese cities and regions that act as mentees. So we already made one program and we, and we try to see from them 
what is the problem, what can we do better. We are done with this now and we are starting with a, with a real program. So this is one of the uh, uh, one of our postcards that you can see. It's also available here. So when you walk out, just take it. You can also here see um, this roll up. So if you see the sign, just look us up and uh, uh, share the information. Uh, basically, we started uh, thinking about okay, let's be specific. Let's see what what uh, five modules we could make to uh, start with specific uh, measures. So we don't cater to cities that don't have any kind of plans. We are moving now from plans and tools that we heard from before to a city that does have a plan and does have some budgeting or some idea where this could budget could could or couldn't come from, and they need to move further. Uh, so any city that applies as a mentor or as a mentee can choose one of these uh, five areas and say, okay, I have a measure in this that I either want to share as a good example or that I want to learn how to find how to um, find financing for it. We don't just uh, bring the two cities together or two regions and let them you know, have coffee and talk about their plans. We actually uh, have a specific program that we guide them through. And in this, again, we didn't bring uh, so much new knowledge as collecting everything from all the projects. So even today, as we are hearing and my colleagues are hearing about new projects you're talking about, we will put them in our project so everybody can learn from them. We. Um, we act as facilitators, we help a mentor and mentee uh, meet four times to achieve their goals and we put this, these goals on paper so in the end we can actually see what, which steps were taken and whether we move forward. So if you decide to join or if you tell somebody uh, to join, this is what we, they will get through, the, uh, four, um, through those uh, four steps. We created specific modules for each of the, uh, each of the modules I told you, uh, specific guidebooks for each of the modules I told you about. So even if you don't have time to join the program, you can look it up online. It will be online in about a week or two. And uh, this is really interesting to share. And you will see now what is in, in those, um, uh, in those um, guidebooks. The first thing we were kind of uh, surprised by is that um, even asking uh, cities to join, they have uh, trouble joining because they really don't know which financing mechanisms to choose in the first place or they don't know which financing mechanisms are available. So there's many information, but they just can't choose from all of them. So we are now just thinking about creating a new module that will just be uh, informative about all the financing uh, mechanisms that are out there. After this, after the, um, some first uh, information about financing, I will give you an example of what we do in public buildings. So what they will get is, uh, it's small, you don't have to read it, it's just uh, to, see, to see what is uh, in the materials. So there is a table like this showing from all the financing mechanisms which projects we identified for what kind of mechanism in which module. So it's not just about uh, talk and from the books, but uh, projects we actually identified that work and uh, which uh, mod uh, financing mechanisms they use. Then for each of these, this is a slide that's not working, sorry. For each of the mechanisms, we list all the projects. And, and again, a city, if they choose uh, EPC, example for public buildings, they can see all the projects that we identified as successful in this, um, in this module. And uh, what is our plan and when you can join or, or when you can uh, share the information for cities and regions to join? Well, we have thir three learning cycles. And uh, we just started with the first one. So for this one, you're too late. But for the second, the campaign is just uh, gonna be open next week. So this is a time to join. This means those four, five steps will start in September and be done sometime uh, by January. So it's not too time consuming. It's just those five meetings in which me we make all the preparation for the mentor and mentee to take the best out of it. And if this is too early, then uh, the third campaign will start at end of uh, 2018. This is your last chance to join in this project. This means in total we will have, we need 30 mentors and we will have 120 mentees um, with the barriers solved for financing uh, sustainable plans. So again, what is a prerequisite? It has to be uh, an employee of a city, region, or an agency working on behalf of a city or a region. They do need to have some kind of sustainable plan. It can be SEAP, SECUP, or anything they, they do to, to show on paper that they are committed. And uh, basically, that's it. We cover the costs, and please uh, let us know if you're interested. Thank you.
Thank you, Mia. That's, that's very clear, and I'm glad you're the last speaker because you could build on the uh, other projects, and that's very complimentary, of course. I, I would like to ask the speakers, please, to come on, on stage and have a seat. Uh, we will have a round of questions now. Uh, we'll spend the last five uh, minutes uh, answering questions. While you're, getting, uh, while you're taking your seat, I'm, I'll respond to the first one that is on the top here. Why, um, why is the EU still spending billions of euros? on fossil fuel subsidies. I mean, I'd like to look at this question on a more uh, positive side. I think there's a clear trend to spend more money on low carbon economy, on climate uh, related actions. So if you take the current programming period, which runs from 2014 until 2020, uh, the European budget is more or less 1 trillion euros, so 1,000 billion euro, and 20% of it is earmarked for uh, actions that contribute to the uh, climate goals. And if you look at the next programming period, the one starting after 2020 for the next seven years, 2021, 2027, the European Commission has made a proposal in a, in a, at the beginning of May and said that they would like to, to increase that share to 25%. So that's a fourth of the total budget. So that, that's more than, I mean, that's nearly 300 billion over that period that will go to activities that are uh, related to and contributing to the climate objective. So that's, that's very positive, I think, and uh, we see that trend uh, not stopping here. Now, we've got other questions there. I think there's one at the top as well, which was voted by seven people. You had people had the opportunity on the iPhone as well to vote for questions. Uh, the question on and data, um, and, and that's something we observe in many, many projects. I mean, how do you overcome that barrier? Uh, what kind of info are the most needed? I, I don't know if any of you has really addressed that uh, aspect in his or her project, but in which case, no, not so much. Yes, Andreas, you want to take the floor? You've got mics on the, on the tables. We had one project, by the way, while you, while you were fixing the micro. The, uh, we had one project specifically looking at uh, data gathering and uh, European, uh, an IE project, Intelligent Energy Europe. So I, the name now, I mean, I'm <laughs> looking at it, Jan, if she remembers the name of Michele, um, the name of that project, looking at uh, specifically at Misotility, misotility, indeed. And uh, so if you go on their website, uh, you will find all the information. Drop, a, drop us an email and we will be glad to send you the link. Andrea, sorry. Data for action. Oh, data for action as well. So there were two, yeah, indeed. One consecutive. Consecutive, one, yeah, one follow-up of the other, yeah. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. If I might try to answer this question very briefly, it's a very complex question and we have dealt with it in our project panel 2050 a little bit. Uh, since I said that one of our first activities was to do some baseline assessments and, and main issue there is also where to get data from and how to assess this data. And well, experience shows that, uh, especially now coming back to our countries, Central Eastern Europe, um, availability of data, national statistics, well, sometimes available. So if we look at top down, let's say level approach, it's, it's, it's possible to to come to some, 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 let's say at least key data that also describe energy uh, supply, energy demand in regions or at a certain, let's say, disaggregated level. Uh, however, uh, where we see the biggest problem is coming up with proper bottom-up data. So to understand, you know, what is, for instance, energy consumption in households, energy consumption industry. How does, I don't know, transportation contribute? I think there is, and, and now I come back to my the country where I'm from, Austria. We, we've also done a lot of regional roadmaps in the past, and we see that this issue is, is, is eminent everywhere. We do have to have, well, we do try to get, a, let's say, a compromised approach where we try to figure out, you know, what is available from the region, what do we get, where we can rely also on data from, from, from EU statistics okay. or base, let's say, top, top down approach data. But where we try to get into, and that is part of the process, and I think that's also why stakeholders are important um, to support this process, is try to elaborate a kind of individual methodology in the region uh, where and how to develop, let's say, uh, data inputs uh, from different sources. I mean, we are just talking about an example of, I don't know, what is the production of renewable energies in a region? 
I mean, this is something that can be assessed from a certain level. We may have some NGOs that are collecting this data. We may have access to energy suppliers. We can also help on that. I think it's also gathering it from different sources. And I think that's also part of the stakeholder engagement process well, yeah. to understand who has certain data and who can also provide this data in, 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 a, in a, let's say, an approach that also will not take forever because timing is also a big issue in, 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 in gathering this data. That's at yep. least our experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joanna, I think there's one question for your project there, which is quite relevant. How were the special, special, special planners convinced about the importance of integrating energy in the planning process? Okay. Uh, although I think Angel, being a special planner, can give us uh, a more uh, uh, a better Yeah, probably, his, yeah. Uh, his uh, personal opinion. Andrea, you found the trick. <laughs> Okay, Are you hold on? You. <laughs> Just use it. Okay, yeah. then. So, uh, would you like to answer? I can. Okay, the, the fast answer is very easily. And in fact, they seem to be convinced beforehand and just waiting for someone just like like us to call them and gather them. In this uh, Libel Lab uh, system, it's very flexible. And I gather people from the energy uh, sector, administration, industry, uh, university research, and from the urban planning and housing policies, also administration, industry, research, university. And, and they were very happy to uh, talk together at different location, different location, and different themes. So in fact, uh, the relevant question was not, um, is uh, in energy to be integrated into the planning system? but how to do it. So for example, the, one of the stakeholders was a partner of the Publanef project, in the CMR in mm -hmm. Spain, and uh, provide with, with kind of solutions. So uh, we gathered them and let them talk together, and it was on. I'd like to add uh, just uh, yeah. very, very uh, brief that uh, with the coming target for, uh, renewable, for renewable penetration and uh, energy efficiency, I think it's not an issue of convincing each other for integrated planning. I mean, it's, uh, it's the only solution. I mean, uh, starting yeah. working all together to, to find room for all this needed. So I think it's what is coming, and uh, we should all uh, be ready for it. Uh, there's a question as well on the list here, which is, I think, relevant for all of you, is uh, who is responsible for the execution of the roadmaps? Are the roadmaps reviewed regularly? And I don't know. Please. Yeah. Uh, well, for R4E, actually, the responsible partner for within our project is really the city themselves. Yes. So the city is the one that's actually initiating the whole process. And, and we, from R4E, of course, facilitated the whole process. But at the end, the real implementation of plans, set, and projects is really of uh, the city. And it's also the responsibility of the city to keep the relevant stakeholders involved in the whole process. At the end, that's really what it's about, about keeping them involved, not just only while really developing the roadmaps, but really into the whole process. Yeah, I think it's more or less the same line. So for us, uh, first of all, start with a partner who is responsible to undertake a city or a region or more cities. So the partner is responsible for setting the plan. The city is responsible for implementing it. Of course, there is a very, uh, I answer to the second questions also, to, if they are reviewed regularly, yes. We do have a monitoring plan, which is on every two months. So we ask partners to come up with data, what they have done, whom they have contacted, why, why, why. And coming up to quantification of indicators. We believe that if you don't review, and you start from first year up to the third year of a Horizon 2020 project, somewhere you will get lost. So it needs, for sure, a proper review two to four months, that's more or less the average time we consider. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, last comment. Just one keyword, I think monitoring is the keyword. I think we need to ensure that the roadmaps are also being continuously monitored. And I think part of the stakeholder process and engagement is also to see uh, how can we uh, establish a proper monitoring, meaning that who is also reviewing what has been implemented and who is also going to um, assess it against the initial targets and the initial plans which are also defined by the roadmap. Okay, thank you. I'm turning to the audience to see uh, if there's one last uh, burning question from, from you and you would like to ask. Otherwise, I'm turning to the speakers as well to ask them if they want to add anything to 
what was said until now. If not, then I'm, I'm, I'm I think I'm concluding by saying that, well, I started by saying that cities and regions have a key role to play. And if in, anyone in the room had any doubts about that, I'm sure doubts have disappeared after all the presentation we heard about, about all these committed people who have done things on the ground and have had uh, things move and uh, result in uh, concrete impacts. A few takeaways that I've noted. Um, I think we've, we've seen the different ingredients that we, have, we need to have for proper planning, proper road ma mapping. There's no one-fits-all solution. I think one of, one of you said it. I mean, it's, it, there's no pre-cooked planning process. I mean, there's need to adapt each process to the local, social, law, legal, economic uh, circumstances. And uh, experimentation is key, as we've heard as well. A lot of pilot uh, cases that, that we can learn of. The format that is chosen for the uh, policy making is also, uh, in policy making process is also very important and uh, can lead to uh, different results. The good planning is essential if uh, later uh, one wants to get access to uh, sources of funding for the implementation of uh, sustainable energy actions. Um, the good planning, good road mapping, but also proper monitoring that was highlighted in this last uh, session here. What is very key, and I think that's something really uh, a point that um, strikes me, is the, uh, the need to involve all the stakeholders. I mean, there were lots of discussions on stakeholders' engagement, including citizens and different services inside public authorities, and, and sometimes services that don't speak uh, to each other. I mean, I, I, we had examples here of services that uh, normally don't talk to each other, and the engagement process is also about bringing these people together around the table and uh, helping them co-create vision and having some ownership and some commitment to uh, implement that vision later on. The role of energy champions or forerunners, I mean, has been highlighted uh, in the first presentation and they can have a significant impact. Uh, it's quite interesting, but uh, we also need political commitment and um, it's hard to move without the political commitment. That was also said by uh, several of the speakers. The need as well to share the experiences between the, the different uh, cities and regions. And uh, we heard about a very nice scheme that uh, enables peer-to-peer -peer learning. From the projects we've supported until now, peer-to-peer -peer has uh, proven to be a very effective team, to uh, effective uh, method to uh, transfer knowledge between different regions and, and cities. We've heard about different tools that have been developed. Some of them will be available very soon. And uh, they will all be available on the websites. Uh, you can find them for free. Uh, so please uh, use them. Uh, H2020 uh, is open access, so all the tools that we develop are available freely. If you're interested in replicating the kind of things that we heard about, you, and you're looking for public money to kick off the, uh, the process, uh, then I'll let you know that uh, H2020 offers different opportunities, the LIFE program as well. Uh, in H2020, we've got a call that is open until the 4th of September this year. Uh, we will have another one next year and open until September. There are opportunities to develop the kind of activities that we have here. After 2020, there will also be opportunities for market uptake activities of the kind we heard about, and that will be under the LIFE program, where we have secured 1 billion euro for the clean energy transition. So there will be a lot of money in there for acting at local level on sustainable energy. And finally, if you would like to continue the discussion on the key role of local actors as drivers of the energy transition and to see how bottom-up changes can make real impacts, then I really invite you to join in this room at 6 o'clock, in this room at 6 o'clock, at a managed energy talk. Uh, that's something we organize. It's for local actors, so that's for you. And uh, you will have a great TED, TED speech uh, from Rob Hopkins, uh, the leader of the transition movement. Uh, very famous. Uh, it would give us a very inspiring talk about uh, local action and the role of local actors in the energy transition. That would be in that room uh, at 6 o'clock. That would be followed by uh, a networking cocktail where we have the opportunity to discuss and mingle between you. So I hope to see you there. I'd like to finish by uh, thanking uh, the uh, colleagues in my team who have uh, helped me prepare for that uh, session. Uh, Cécile Carabel and, and Michele Sansoni were sitting here but uh, also very much, I mean, the one who was behind that session and coordinated between all the speakers, was Marek Most. I um, don't know if Marek, if you want to stand up, is here, if you want to talk to him, uh, from the Tartu Regional Energy Agency. And I thank you to all the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you.